I've been working on this thing for about 10 years, it seems like. But I thought about it and I said, you know, sometimes in order to fully understand a problem, you have to like really experience it and live it. And I have been living this problem with some of these guys that make this music for a long time. And I said, maybe now is the time to tell the world, even if the solution isn't quite fully crafted yet, maybe it's time just to let people know what we might do to help some of my friends. Now, I'm an eternal student, so I've been learning things my entire life. Um, teaching myself, autodidactic, right? You go to school, you get a degree, you come out, you get with guys, girls, they teach you about life. You try to understand how to learn and become a better person. So with that being part of who I am, um, when I first heard jazz, I was real curious about it, and I think I put that out there in the universe. And because of that, mentors started showing up. Uh, I walk in a music store, and uh, the guy next to me, his name is Bob Gibbons. He says, um, I see you looking at that bass over there. Why don't you pick it up? So I picked the bass up. Next thing you know, I'm in his house, in his basement, listening to John Coltrane, trying to play like Jimmy Garrison. He finally taught me some of the secrets and the tricks to how to make the music sound like I thought I might want it to sound. And he would give me these anecdotes that were breadcrumbs along the way. He'd say things like, learn the song and then forget it. Or um, uh, music, jazz is, in particular, is the Pacific Ocean. And your brain is nothing but a teacup. So get the scooping. <laughs> you know, things that just help me understand the vastness of the endeavor that these guys were soldiering on. And then as I met Bob, I met Ray Brown, I met Les McCann, these guys were my heroes and I got to meet them, break bread with them, and there, there's this narrative that was common amongst all these guys, the street musicians, the guys who had big record contracts, they all seemed to experience this one problem. They were having a hard time making a living as a citizen of the United States of America through their art, through selling their music, you know? So I started thinking about that. Now, I don't particularly have that problem because I'm a technologist also. So I'm, I'm trained as a computer scientist, master's degree, been working in Fortune 500 companies for almost 20 years now. So I always had another way to go and make money. But the arts always fascinated me, mostly because it included a component, two components that my technology didn't seem to have. One was culture, and two was spirituality. And as I started looking at what I wanted my life to be, I started wanting to be more like them. But of course, by that time, the wifey and the three kidsies and the, <laughs> the college for them and all the rest of that stuff kind of prevented me from wanting to sacrifice their lives so that I could go and experience this thing that I had discovered was going to be something important in my life. But still, that problem presented itself. And these guys are all friends with me. They asked me to come and play with them, even though I'm not good enough to really play with them. So there's something there going on with how they share the community, they share the information. So I had to figure out a way to give something back and help them. So if I know all this technology, maybe there's a way I can use this technology to help them make a better living. Now, one of the stories that Bob used to tell me was that time. There's always that time. That time he was in Small's Palace and he saw John Coltrane smoking that night. We couldn't even imagine what that sounded like. Now, unfortunately, nobody recorded that concert. So the only thing we had was Bob's memories on exactly what that concert might sound like, his enthusiasm for telling the story and what we can hear on the records. Now, there are a few live recordings, but because the record industries really aren't set up to A, record live music, and B, promote live performances, that just kind of stuck in my head, you know? I missed Coltrane. He died before I got to see him play live. But these other guys that are around, Les McCann, Ray Brown, I got to see them, but there were still not so many recordings of them. 
And sometimes they'd just be in their basement in their garage playing, and it would be fantastic. So I keep thinking on that. That stuck with me, that stuck with me, right? And then one day, a friend of mine showed me a device. And this right here is a Tascam digital recorder, right? And we used to take these with us to do bootlegs of the guys in the clubs. And the club owners didn't want us to have men there, but we would do stuff. Terry was really good at that. He would stick it in his shirt pocket, right? Pop up his lapel, nobody would even know he had it, right? <laughs> so that kind of played around, it stuck. I'm living life with the guys. They're still telling me what they do. I'm getting to know these club owners who are vicious businessmen. They are just really rough to deal with. I get to know some artists and repertoire guys. They're very, very hard to deal with. They're the entryway into the music business. So then, along comes, this is a hub with some MP3 sticks. And this right here is an actual miniature MP3 player, right? So I'm seeing this on one end, and I'm seeing this on the other end. So now I'm thinking, huh. What would happen if I took the bootleg and I was able to put it on the MP3 sticks? Could I give the MP3 sticks to the people in the audience when the performance was finished? Well, that would require, hmm, laptop with some software in it, some secret sauce. Well, lo and behold, I'm a computer engineer. I know how to make secret sauce. <laughs> I give with a couple of my friends. We start messing around with it. We've been messing around with it for about 10 years. But the idea seems like it may have gotten leapfrogged because these things showed up and the Internet of Things showed up and everybody was talking about downloading music to your phones and ringtones. But for some reason, that idea still seemed to have some legs. So I just bounced it off a couple of my friends, and they said to me an interesting thing. They said that the community aspect, the art of the feeling of just giving away things, right? And I say, hold up, stop right there. You're not talking about giving away your music. He said, no, but what if you gave all of us one of those systems. How much music could we make with it? And I stopped for a minute and I said, uh oh, I think I've been approaching this all wrong because I've been trying to come up with a business model for manufacturing and selling and retail and I was becoming a record company. I said, maybe I'm approaching this all wrong. I went and investigated that. I put together a nonprofit called Baltimore Jazz House and we are starting to raise money so we can hire enough people to start manufacturing systems like this so we can give them to the artists and then they can make the music and give us all what we want to hear. Fish, Dave Matthews Band, Grateful Dead, they all have versions of this where their communities go out and they just trade music. They started with cassette decks, you know? So I was supposed to do slides, but in the true nature of jazz, I started riffing, right? And you guys came right along with me. That, in essence, is the nature of jazz music. It takes you on journeys and trips where you've never been before, based all on the person on the stage entertaining you. One slide, saving a slice of the American pie. The American pie, sweet taste of jazz. If we can get these systems in the hands of the jazz artists, every performance they make can be recorded and given to us. Every recording they make can be saved and archived. Every recording they make we can enjoy and enrich our lives. That's my talk.